Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Alors, on a déjà eu l'opportunité et euh, il a pu euh, rencontrer quelques personnes de, dans le cadre de, enfin, des partenaires de ce projet. C'est une très bonne chose. Je, on a discuté un peu par rapport aux objectifs du projet et il m'a dit voilà, je vais juste dire bonjour et vous souhaiter donc une bonne continuation. Donc, Monsieur le Ministre, si, si vous voulez, euh, vous êtes le bienvenu pour passer un petit mot euh, improvisé. Comme d'habitude. <laughs> Comme d'habitude. Uh, then I have to speak English or uh, Spanish. Uh, I have to, to begin with, uh, by saying Aslema. Aslema is typically Aslema is typically Tunisian, uh, and. Uh, je vais, euh, je vais parler arabe, euh, arabe. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rahim. Donc, euh, je suis vraiment heureux, 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 et c'est un grand plaisir, honneur d'être parmi vous, juste pour vous dire euh, bonjour, parce que quand même cette panoplie de, de jeunes et de moins jeunes, d'experts en la matière, en matière d'analyse de, des, des data, de tout ce qui est euh, au mix, ce qui a été fait par la Tunisie en, en ce domaine. Et je ne vais pas parler euh, Covid. Le Covid est derrière nous. C'est vrai, la Tunisie a réussi sa, sa bataille, sa riposte contre le Covid. Et vous savez tous que c'était grâce à l'effort de tout le monde. Tout le monde a travaillé, tout le monde a donné, tout le monde a donné de, de, de soi, de, de, donc la main dans la main, les structures de l'État, la société civile, les associations, les volontaires, pour faire quand même, ce n'est pas de l'acquis, c'était pour nous un, un miracle de, de vacciner plus que 50 000 personnes par heure du jamais vu. Et si nous avons réussi ce challenge, nous pouvons, mais nous sommes dans l'obligation maintenant, de réussir d'autres challenges. Et là, je crois donc la balle est dans notre camp, à nous tous, pour ce domaine, entre autres, d'analyse, de data. Donc, ce conseil de l'Égypte que je remercie et euh, je tiens à lui dire bonjour à Raslem euh, du fond du cœur pour tout ce qu'il a fait pour euh, l'Institut Pasteur de Tunis, mais aussi pour la Tunisie, et ce qu'il fait, ce qu'il a fait pour l'Afrique, ce qu'il a fait pour la santé dans le monde. Parce que le Covid nous a aussi démontré, nous a, nous a donné beaucoup de belles leçons, que la santé n'est pas dans une seule région, la santé c'est le monde entier. On ne peut pas éradiquer, par exemple, euh, ou bien combattre le Covid dans une petite région comme notre belle Tunisie et dire ça va, ça y est. D'ailleurs, ça a été annoncé par le, le directeur général de, de l'OMS. On ne peut dire qu'il qu n'y a plus de Covid lorsqu'il n'y a plus de Covid dans le monde entier. Et donc, si a travaillé donc, euh, euh, en, en Afrique, euh, je ne me rappelle plus où... <rire> Les oui, euh, mais dans le cadre de l'Institut Pasteur, il est à Paris. Et vous savez sûrement que l'Institut Pasteur Tunis donc, était le troisième, donc après celui de Paris et celui de, je sais pas où, de Saigon. Saigon. Euh, et là, c'est une fierté. Je, je suis tellement fier que l'Institut Pasteur de Tunis a fait et fait des miracles. Vous savez sûrement que l'Institut Pasteur de Tunis... Euh, fabriquer le vaccin contre la variole. La variole qui est maintenant éradiquée dans le monde entier. Et il a continué à fabriquer le vaccin de la variole même après l'éradication pour avoir ce stock stratégique. Donc maintenant nous sommes sur d'autres projets. Ce n'est pas un secret. Mais nous sommes sur d'autres beaux projets. Euh, toujours avec ces Tunisiennes, ces Tunisiens mais aussi avec beaucoup d'amis de la Tunisie. Donc, je vais m'arrêter là. Euh, je vous souhaite euh, beaucoup de succès dans cet atelier, dans cette conférence, mais aussi dans, dans, dans votre avenir que, que j'espère euh, prospère pour les uns et les autres, pour les générations futures. 
Merci, bonne continuation. Well, a few years ago, I do not use my <laughs> glasses now. It's important. <laughs> I get old. <laughs> well, so I think we have to reprise and uh, get and to dive into uh, science. And, uh, and we have, I think, uh, Tony Gabaldon, who is uh, waiting for us. Isn't it? Am I? Yeah. So, uh, Tony Gabaldon, of course, it's a great pleasure to have you with us on board on this project. And, of course, he's a renowned... Uh, really a uh, scientist in, uh, in, in the field of comparative genomics and uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to, to uh, uh, leave him the floor uh, for a, a keynote lecture uh, pertaining to new avenues in comparative genomics. So it's a great pleasure to have with us Tony Gabaldon. Tony Gabaldon, do you so, hear me? Thank you. Ah, okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well. So thank you for, for this nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of our work. I will now uh, share the screen. I hope it works. Okay. You see my screen? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so without further delay, I will, I will start. So my talk is going to be a bit about um, new avenues in comparative genomics to study host pathogen interactions. And, and I will illustrate this, um, this, use, this use of comparative genomics by highlighting some of the projects uh, we are doing in, in my own group. So, but I think this, this topic, although I will, I will talk about uh, fungal pathogens, which is the topic of, of my, my research, I think the, the issue extends to all kinds of pathogens. And the fact is that um, genomics uh, have come to stay. And, and this is a picture showing uh, how the, the prices of sequencing here, it says the cost of a full human sequence, but you could um, put this also for any cost of sequencing, just a megabase, uh, sequencing of a megabase of data or something, it has been dropping continuously since the advent uh, of, uh, of short-read sequencing, such as uh, that of Illumina. And this has, uh, in a way, popularized the use of, of genome sequencing, but not only of genome sequencing, but also of transcriptome sequencing, and a lot of uh, new sequencing-based applications, such as ChIPSEC, uh, ATAXIC, and HiC, and other approaches that are based on the use of genomic sequencing to study uh, genome, uh, the sequence of the genome, how it is regulated, how it is uh, expressed, and so on. And regarding pathogens, uh, the study of pathogens, the emerging trends that are increasingly using uh, genomics approaches uh, belong to the fields of diagnosis, molecular epidemiology, and host pathogen interactions and also monitoring of, of diseases. And, and today we'll focus on, on this one. But um, I want to, to maybe mention some of, uh, of the reviews that, that we wrote on, on, this, on these topics. One focuses on, on uh, diagnostics, the other one on comparative genomics, and the other one on, on transcriptomics of host pathogen. Uh, host microbe interactions. The three of them are focused on fungal pathogens, but I think the, the same concepts and the same challenges and the same uh, state of the art applies uh, to other, other pathogens. So now I will, I will move into, into, into illustrating how one can use uh, genomics uh, to study host pathogen interactions by giving you uh, one topic that I know best, which is, um, which is that of, of fungal pathogens, which is pathogens of the genus Candida, which has been the focus of, of uh, research in the group for, for many years, and in which we have been increasingly used uh, genomics approaches. 
So here uh, I want to to highlight that you know genomics. I mean, it stands from comparative genomics when you compare uh, the sequences of different species and try to to find which is unique or shared among different groups of species. But also, it has now, thanks to the availability of more and more genomes, it has increased resolution. So now we can use comparative genomics also to study variations within a given species by taking sampling, samples from different locations of, or even serial sam samples from the same patient and then looking at the specific mutations that appeared in the course of uh, recent evolution. We have seen this uh, very clearly used in the, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemics uh, where many genomes were sequenced and this helped us to understand how the virus was evolving all, almost uh, in real time. But also, I think one uh, recent uh, approach that has been uh, been exploited and in which I will be talking about today is, is to use uh, in vitro evolution, which is to put the pathogen to evolve within uh, given specific conditions or uh, in, a, in a given, you know, uh, animal host to study how it evolves uh, within these, these conditions. And then we can sequence uh, these strains at the start and at the end of the experiments and follow up uh, which mutations which mutations appeared. And finally, I will also talk about dual RNA-seq, which is a technique in which we are using here. The example is with bacterial pathogens, but I will explain with, with candida pathogens, and this could be explained, I mean, could be used to any, any type of pathogen, in which by using sequencing uh, the transcripts, uh, we want to understand what is the level of expression of different genes in the host and in the pathogen at the same time, so to follow these host-pathogen interactions. So we focus on the emergence. So one of the questions we have in the group is, is how new pathogens emerge. Uh, because as I think there's no need to explain this very much after the COVID-19 pandemics. We all know that we are exposed to, to new pathogens that may come in the future. They may come from, from animals or from the environment, or maybe we don't know from where they will come, but it's clear that we'll be exposed to new emerging pathogens. And the fact is that the number of, of outbreaks has been increased um, over, over the recent years, maybe in part due to globalization or climate change or or other factors, but uh, the fact is that the number of outbreaks uh, are increasing for all types of pathogens, so fungal, fungal pathogens, parasites, viruses, and, and so on. And we focus on, on, on fungal pathogens, which are you know, one class of these emerging new pathogens, and for which we, we are witnessing uh, species that were previously rare, and now they are increasing their incidence. And just a few words on fungal pathogens. Um, they are uh, usually opportunistic pathogens, but globally they cause uh, a lot of uh, a lot of deaths collectively. And also, they are important plant pathogens. They can cause the, the loss of one third of the crops uh, worldwide, and they're also a threat for the environment and causing the extinction of endangered species. Uh, mostly, uh, we have heard about amphibian species uh, being infected by fungi and also bat species and they have increased their incidence in recent decades. And also one, one important problem nowadays with the fungal pathogens is the, the increased resistance to antifungal drugs. And we are uh, witnessing more and more uh, multidrug resistant fungi that we cannot treat anymore uh, with the current uh, antifungal armamentarium that we have at our hands. So within fungi, we specifically focus on, on candida pathogens. And candida pathogens are important and interesting because although they are all named candida, they are, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, they do not form a monophyletic clade. They belong to different lineages within the yeast, uh, the Saccharomycotina yeast. For instance, you have here candida glabrata, which is actually closer to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we use to make bread or beer. And then we have other clades of, of, uh, of pathogens uh, in this group, uh, where we have Candida albicans, which is the most known one, but uh, is not the unique uh, Candida pathogen. We have other lineages that also acquire the ability to infect humans. So our question is how, how new pathogens emerge and how they interact with humans and how they also become resistant to drugs when we start treating them. 
So the question of how pathogens emerge, I think is relevant because if you take every known pathogen, they always have uh, close relatives that are non-pathogenic to humans. And even if you consider, you know, of course, uh, the ability to infect humans relates to the immune status of the host. Uh, but even if you, if you discuss, you know, that maybe some pathogens only infect uh, immunocompromised hosts, such as some of the fungal pathogens, still, uh, when there is this uh, immunocompromised conditions, there is always some species that are more adapted um, to infect this, this host than, than others. So we want to understand this. And for many years, we have tried to leverage uh, comparative genomics to, to understand how this happens. So our strategy is basically this one. We sequence uh, pathogens and their close relatives, and we uh, compare the genomes under an evolutionary angle. So what we do is to trace all mutations and all changes in the genome to try to identify the changes uh, in the genome that happened previous to the ability of these pathogens uh, to infect humans. And uh, I will briefly talk only of one of these examples. We have done this in different uh, groups of candida, but I will uh, talk to you about the candida clabrata because it's the most striking one because it's within a clade of non-pathogenic species. So we sequence all the described species that are close to Candida glabrata. This is a clade called uh, Nacasiomyces, in which you have Candida glabrata, which is uh, um, an important pathogen. It usually ranks the second uh, cause of candidiasis. But you also have two mild pathogens, Candida bracariensis and Candida nivariensis, which are only rarely found in, uh, in clinical settings. And then you have you know, species that have been only isolated from the environment. So what we did was to trace all changes uh, across the genomes, and we found out that this uh, short, I don't know if you see my pointer, but uh, here the red branch that is the shortest one at the base of Nacasomyces, which is the, the, the shortest one, was actually the, the, the situation where most changes in the genome happened. And actually many of the of the traits that were supposed to be important for Candida glabrata to infect humans, such as the ability to grow at 37 degrees, already appeared here and are shared by pathogenic and non-pathogenic species. So this means that the ability to grow at higher temperature may be important for infection, but it's not the trait that differentiates the pathogens versus the non-pathogens. So when we look closer, we found actually one gene family that was correlating very well with the ability to infect humans. And this was one family called the APA-like adhesins, which are cell wall proteins that are mediate addition of the yeast to different surfaces, including uh, maybe host tissues. And if you look at this family, you see that the non-pathogen species have known copy or maybe only one copy of this gene, whether uh, the pathogenic species have uh, several copies of this, of this family. And uh, the most pathogenic one, Candida glabrata, had 14 copies, had the largest number of copies. Whereas the, the, the milder ones uh, had a lower number of, of gene copies. So in this case was, uh, to us, uh, this suggested that the increased addition may be the trait that was uh, instrumental in differentiating uh, the species within this clade, the ones that uh, were able to infect humans. So maybe, um, Addition is something that we should monitor uh, to, uh, to understand the potential pathogenicity of other Gs maybe in the, in the environment. Uh, later on, we have corroborated this in other groups of candida species, and it seems that the cell wall repertoire and the ability to adhere to different substrates may be a key uh, virulence factor for these pathogens. So, uh, in the interest of time, I won't uh, give you more results, just to tell you that uh, nowadays we are uh, increasing, we are not just comparing uh, different genomes from different species, but we are actually moving into comparing uh, whole genomes uh, for different strains collected from different parts of the world. And using this genomic information, we can trace how the different outbreaks uh, may be related uh, from different parts of the, of the world. So as conclusions from this part is that, you know, uh, it's important to see that maybe many traits that are now important for infections are ancient of the clade and, and may, maybe did not appear recently. And in this group of pathogens, maybe addition was the key property 
that was uh, acquired recently. And this has implications in which uh, we can monitor maybe uh, environmental species for their pathogenic potential. For most of the species, we found out that a human is not the main niche. These are opportunistic species. I didn't explain that we found out that these species, although uh, they are considered to be a sexual species because nobody has managed to make them mate, in the lab we found evidence for uh, recombination and introgression between different clades. So for us, it's clear that they do have uh, sexual reproduction maybe in the environment. And I didn't talk about that, but we found that uh, other groups of candida pathogens actually became pathogens after hybridization between different species. And we found that this may be a common route for the emergence of pathogens, uh, uh, at least in candida species. Now the second example is to understand how they interact with humans. And, and our question here was, okay, they are different species, they belong to very different clades, so uh, do human cells react to them in a similar way? Do they use similar strategies or they use different strategies? Because in the clinics, many of them are treated just as candida uh, pathogens and not uh, actually taking into account that they are actually indeed uh, different species. So we devised one experiment in which we were, being, uh, we were exposing the four main candida pathogens, uh, candida glabrata, candida albicans, parapsilosis, and candida tropicalis, all of them belonging to different lineages, to human uh, epithelial cells. Because we think the epithelium is the first barrier uh, for candida infections, mostly because also these candidas can be part of our commensal flora. So we did this experiment and then we, we extracted the RNA and we did dual RNA seq, which means we can trace the expression of the genes from the candida pathogens and also for the human pathogens. And uh, with the first thing we found is that if we look uh, for each of the candida species, which are depicted uh, here, and we look which pathways they, in, they activate at different time points when interacting with human cells, we see that each candida is behaving totally different. Uh, and this correlates with different strategies they have. Uh, also, you can observe under the microscope. For instance, candida albicans forms hyphae and break out the, 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 macro, uh, I mean the cells, whereas candida glabrata doesn't do that. And, and and doesn't uh, break the cells. So they, they have different morphologies, and this is reflected also in different batteries of genes that are expressed uh, at different time points. So each candida behaves its own way. When we look at the human side, we notice uh, that uh, at an early time point, uh, all the epithelial cells were responding the same way, regardless of which species of candida they were facing. So they recognize uh, there is candida, and they react uh, in the same way. At later time points, we see a more specific response that varies according to the candida species. So one thing that calls our attention at the, at the early time points is to see a lot of um, uh, processes related to mitochondrial function. So we were wondering uh, why mitochondrial function was overexpressed um, in in epithelial cells in response to candida species. And uh, with further experiments, um, we found out that actually this overexpression of mitochondrial genes was related to the fact that, uh, that the, the epithelial cells was, were actually uh, secreting uh, mitochondrial DNA and changing the morphology of mitochondria uh, in a signal uh, in a signaling pathway that was known for viruses, but uh, for viral infections, but was not known for fungal infections. So apparently the epithelial cells is, are releasing this mitochondrial DNA to activate type 1 interferon response and to uh, call uh, the immune system to, to arrive um, to, the, to the cells when they are being damaged. So this seems like this works like an alarm uh, to call the immune system to arrive to the site of infection. Of course, in our system, we didn't have uh, neutrophils or, or macrophages, but uh, the cells were signaling uh, anyway. So this is a PCA plot showing the different um, samples uh, that, we, that we analyze. The different species are different shapes, the different colors are different time points, and this, is, uh, this summarizes the host response. So what we saw is that um, 
that there is this axis, the X axis was more or less relating to the time. This is time zero, this is the control. And then after three hours, four hours, and, and the more later in time, we go uh, more uh, to the right of the, of the plot. But we saw also the second axis, the Y axis, that was kind of differentiating the, the species. Like Candida albicans was always at the top, then you had uh, Clabrata and, and Parapsilosis, and then you had uh, you know, Tropicalis and, and, and also Parapsilosis here at the bottom. So um, we figure out that these species maybe, we didn't know what this axis was, uh, was indicating, but we suspected they may be indicating damage. Because when we measure the damage uh, of the different species, we saw that Candida albicans was causing the largest damage to the cells, uh, followed by uh, Glabrata and Tropicalis, and then, and then by Parapsilosis, so following this, this axis. So it seemed that this, this second axis was um, featuring the level of damage, and that uh, epithelial cells were responding depending on the damage they were feeling from, from, the, from the candida. So to, to assess that, we, we also uh, treated the cells with heat-inactivated candida, and the result we got is that these points were clustering with a, with a non-infective control, which means that, okay, if the candida are dead, the cells are not sensing anything, suggesting that is, they are not detecting anything on the surface of the candida cells, but they are maybe detecting some interaction, probably some of the damage. We also did one uh, experiment with one candida albicans mutant in which the, the one gene encoding for, the, for one toxin of candida albicans, which is uh, responsible for making the damage, was uh, knocked out. And uh, according to our predictions, uh, this mutant behaved, you know, moved the candida albicans to this, to this axis uh, down below together with the species that was causing uh, the least damage reinforcing the idea that these uh, the, the epithelial cells were responding according to the damage uh, perceived. So I do not have more time to, to discuss this, but one thing we also looked at is, is to, because we have dual uh, RNA-seq, in terms of the candida species, we asked the question whether we observe uh, non-coding transcripts also being expressed specifically during infection. And actually, we detected many non-coding uh, transcripts, long non-coding RNAs, that are specifically expressed uh, during the infection process. So far, this is just a catalog of putative uh, infection-related um, long non-coding RNAs that we think is, uh, it has potential because maybe it's, it's a source for new targets for new drugs. Um, we don't know, and the only thing we can do is to look at their co-expression with protein coding genes to infer what function they may have. But incidentally, uh, another group uh, working independently in another project and doing one mutagenesis experiment identify one of our predicted long non-coding RNAs as being actually a virulence factor in, in candida auris. So they knocked out these long non-coding RNAs and they showed that this strain um, was uh, less virulent than the, than, the wild type, than the wild type strain. So I think this holds potential for long non-coding RNAs as new players in, in fungal infections. So the last, uh, in the last few minutes, I'm going to discuss um, one last application of, of comparative genomics, uh, which relates in, uh, to how uh, candida become resistant to drugs. So you can see, you know, how many different things you can you can understand on your pathogens uh, using using genomics. So I already said that uh, you know antif antifungal drug resistance is a problem. We have uh, only three main families of drugs uh, that is difficult to find drugs for fungi because they are close to to metazoans, so they're close to humans, so, so it's difficult to find drugs that do not have severe secondary effects in, in humans. So most of the drugs attacked, uh, you know, ergosterol, which is a unique uh, membrane component uh, in fungi that does not exist in our cell, or cell wall, or the cell wall components that uh, our cells do not have, of course. But we have a limited number of antifungal compounds. 
and the drug resistance is increasing all over the world, both in human pathogens and in plant pathogens. And the number of, you know, uh, multi-drug resistance is uh, also alarmingly increasing. So we know uh, some mechanisms of resistance, so some cells may adapt by increasing the, the activity of pumps that pump out the drug, or they may have mutations in the in the place where the drug is binding, in the target, but we didn't know whether we, we know all the, all the mechanisms of resistance. And also from an evolutionary perspective, we also were interested to know how the process was acquiring. You, know, you think about how the candida cells are adapting to, to, to the drugs. So to do this, we, we devised one experiment uh, of in vitro evolution in which we put different populations of candida clobrata evolving uh, for, for many generations under treatment. So we treated some populations with fluconazole, some with anidula fungin. These are representatives of two main classes of drugs. We put some populations in a combination of the two drugs, and then we had some populations that were uh, in YPD, like a, a control without any drug. So we put uh, different populations with different genetic backgrounds uh, from a collection of, of strains taken from different parts of the world, and we evolved them for um, several, uh, I mean, more than 200 generations. And then after this treatment, uh, uh, what we did was to change uh, those that were exposed to fluconazole, we exposed them to anidula fungin, and those that were exposed to anidula fungin, we exposed them to fluconazole. So to simulate a change in the drug regime that sometimes happened in the clinic. And after all these evolution experiments, we measure phenotypes and also uh, we sequence some of the genomes to understand uh, which mutations may happen. So uh, this is just to show you, uh, we also did um, measure uh, phenotypes and this is the way we did. I mean, we measure uh, growth at different concentrations of the drug and then we have this type of plots and we can measure the area under the curve. This is our proxy for fitness. And when you represent this uh, for fluconazole, you see that the control, you know, the, the unevolved strains and the ones they want the control, they, are, they have low uh, fitness uh, in the presence of any drugs. And when you track, when you treat with annular fungin, all the populations that were treated with annular fungin, they increase their fitness, which shows uh, that they, uh, they acquire resistance, and the same for fluconazole. However, we noticed that uh, some populations that were treated uh, with fluconazole, they also, uh, that were treated with annular fungin only, they also acquired resistance to fluconazole. You see here, this population was treated only with annular fungin, uh, but some of these strains were also adapted to fluconazole. So here you can see maybe more clear. Um, so you see uh, res the MIC. Uh, minimum inhibitor concentration for fluconazole, depending on the treatment, and you say you see that the column that say, that says anidula fungin, you have a dual profile. Some strains are expected; they are they are susceptible to anidula fungin. They never saw the drug, but some strains were actually resistant to to anidula fungin, even though they never encountered this drug. So this, this, this is called cross-resistance, and uh, our experiments were showing that 50% of the strains that will be adapted to annular fungin will uh, acquire uh, cross-resistance to, to fluconazole. So this, this, is, uh, this is important because um, uh, actually in the clinics, uh, the, the current guidelines recommend treating first with annular fungin and then flu with fluconazole. And our results show that this may, may, be, may cause trouble, at least in candida clarata, uh, so that if you treat with annular fungin, 50% of the, of the populations will become adaptive, not only to annular fungin, but also to fluconazole. So when you treat with the second drug, um, this, this, won't, uh, this won't be successful. Interestingly, we didn't see the opposite. So when you treat first with fluconazole, you never see cross-resistance to anidula fungi. So to understand all this, we sequence some of the strains, and, and, and here is just uh, telling you about a pipeline we developed, which is Persuade, which is uh, 
pipeline uh, thought to find structural variations and optimize for any given species. And this, we developed this because most of the tools that were developed were optimized for humans. Uh, so if you are interested in a non-human species, maybe you can try this one. Uh, on top of a structural variation, it calls all type of, uh, of variations, from SNPs to copy number variations and all the rest. So uh, we, we had this panel of mutations that we observe in all the strains. So we observe sometimes you observe a nucleoides, so some chromosomes duplicate, and these are the chromosomes that carry uh, ergosterol, which is one of the targets for fluconazole. This is a known mechanism of resistance. And then we found uh, a panel of nine genes that were uh, recurrently mutated, meaning that we found these, uh, these genes mutated in at least two, two strains, I mean, two independent populations. So we found some known mechanisms uh, like ERK11 and PDR1 and uh, FSK1. So these are uh, known mechanisms that were known before, but we found also new these five new genes that were never previously related uh, to these uh, resistance mechanisms. So some uh, is easy to find what they are probably doing, like this efflux pump probably is uh, secreting the drug. But then we found other mutations in other targets of their ergosterol pathway, uh, different from ERK11, which is the, the target of the drug. And we identify ERK3 as the mutation responsible for the cross resistance we observed between annular fungin and, and fluconazole. Because all strains that show this cross resistance, they had acquired mutations in this, in this gene. So we, we could discover this cross resistance mechanism. So just to finish, uh, because I think I'm going over the time, um, what we are doing now is try to find weak points uh, for, this, uh, for this resistance. Our idea is that uh, evolution tells you that you can adapt to everything. Uh, if you adapt very much to one thing, probably you have a fitness course in other conditions. So we are uh, screening for phenotypes and we implemented something that we can do it kind of a, of a high throughput way using a cheap in-house system in which we just couple uh, scanners uh, to a computer, we take pictures every 15 minutes and we follow the growth of the, of the yeast colonies and from this we can develop uh, uh, growth curves. So we are uh, putting this uh, as a free software online and we are also planning to, to publish this protocol. I think it can be useful for many other labs without uh, sophisticated robots. And another thing we are doing is to, thanks to the presence of one uh, drug screen utility in the IR, uh, using these multi-drug resistant drugs, uh, so multi-drug resistant strains from our evolution experiment, uh, we are using it as a platform to find uh, new drugs. And we are screening different uh, compound libraries to these uh, multi-drug resistant uh, strains. And we are finding, uh, you know, drugs uh, that that only kill uh, the wild type strain, but not the resistant. These are probably uh, compounds that are redundant with the ones we have. We are finding uh, some compounds that specifically kill only the multi-drug resistant strains, but do nothing to the wild type. These are maybe pointing to uh, weaknesses acquired in the process of becoming resistant to the drug. And then we are finding um, drugs uh, that are effective to the wild type and also to the multi-drug resistance. And these are the type of drugs that we are interesting, interested because they kill the multi-drug resistant strains. Uh, it's probably because they use totally different uh, targets. Probably they, they hit different drug targets and there may be promising uh, new drugs for uh, alternative treatments that will overcome uh, resistance. So, so we are following up this and with this, yeah, I want to uh, to conclude of these, you know, crossroads between drugs, between phenotypes, and with, uh, you know, changes in, in needs and ecosystem pre-adaptations. And with this, I would like to thank everybody that participated uh, in this project from my group. The, the names are listed here, and all of you for listening. And I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you. Well, Tony, thank you very much for this very nice talk. And um, 
as I said earlier, we are dealing with excellence in this twinning project. And please uh, allow me to introduce you also Tony, although it's at the end of his presentation, but I have here a paper uh, provided to me by Sadri. So just to let you know that in 2018, uh, Tony has been considered as a highly cited researcher by Clarivate Analytics. He has been awarded both the difficult to reach starting and consolidated grants of the European Research Council. And in 2017, he received the Margaret Day of Career Award by the Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution. He has been elected member of the Spanish, European, and Global Young Academies and corresponded member of the Royal National Academy of Pharmacy in Spain. He's currently president of the Spanish Society for Evolutionary Biology. And I'm quite sure that a young researcher has enjoyed working and um, being in a close uh, uh, interaction with people like uh, Tony Gabaldon and also with our uh, colleagues that have uh, joined us in uh, Find Access from uh, Max Planck, from uh, Institute Pasteur, and uh, f uh, from uh, uh, also Robert Koch Institute. So uh, this is just uh, to, to let you know uh, about uh, the career of our uh, collaborators in Find Access. And uh, yes, I think there are room for a few questions, but before I would like to invite uh, on the podium podium uh, Sadri, Sadri uh, Znaidi, who is going with Professor Kusay Deleji, who will be joining us later to uh, moderate uh, this uh, morning session. Uh, so Sadri is the work package for Lever. You know all about Sadri, very talented young researcher. And uh, thank you, Sadri, for all your efforts in uh, helping and assisting all these young researchers in uh, fulfilling their objectives. Thank you. You have the floor. Thanks, Helmi. You can hear me. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here today. Uh, thanks uh, to you guys for being here, for attending this meeting. Uh, and uh, so d in the audience, are there questions for Tony? OK, here we have. Can you speak loud, please? Thank you. Uh, just a question about louder about the mechanism of uh, uh, of resistance. <laughs> about the, just uh, please a short explanation about the uh, mechanism of uh, resistance uh, air uh, protein folding protein. Uh, how would the folding of protein uh, could uh, uh, be a mechanism of uh, resistance? It's uh, C N E one. A mechanism of drug resistance, uh, which gene are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I know which, I mean, yeah. I understand the question. So it's from the genes we identified uh, to have, um, I mean, we don't know the mechanism uh, actually because we identified within these genes are implicated because we see they are mutated recurrently in our evolution experiments in strains that became resistant. Uh, because the mutations appear uh, several times independently, we think they are not by chance. Uh, so this protein is one protein that uh, the annotation says is involved in protein folding within the endoplasmic reticulum. So there may be different ways in which this could impact uh, resistance. Maybe it participates in the folding of one protein that is important to sustain damage in the cell wall or in the cell membrane. Uh, and by mutating this protein, maybe you alter the composition of the cell wall or, or cell membrane because one of the proteins that will be secreted is not properly folded. But uh, these are only hypotheses uh, for now. I think this list of genes are genes that we should look out. I think they, they, they act in combination with the with other uh, typical uh, drug resistance mutations, and maybe only increase fitness in, 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 in these cells. Thanks, Tony. Additional question, Balkis. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tony, for this really important 
uh, and interesting conference. Uh, my question is simple. I just want to uh, know if you uh, have, have had chance to conduct some philoproteomic also analysis or do you have any proteomic data related to these conditions to address your uh, hypothesis and uh, conclusion, concluding remarks? Uh, no, we don't have uh, proteomic data in these in these uh, conditions, but we are following this up. I mean, we we think the the resistant ones they have different, probably different cell wall profile uh, due to the mutations we we observe, and also the the sensitivities they have to cell wall stress. We found that all that become resistant to anidra fungin, which is a drug uh, targeting cell wall and they are more sensitive to calcofluor white and, and other stresses that affect cell wall. So we suspect they have different cell wall proteome composition. So, so we want to follow this up, but we don't have the data yet. That's a good suggestion. Okay, uh, so we have a question from uh, the, um, those that are online interacting with us. Uh, question from Afe Freis. Thanks for this very interesting talk. I have one question regarding local flora perturbation that is usually associated with candida overgrowth in the vagina and how it may impact drug responsiveness. Can we imagine that acting over this flora perturbation could pave the way or path for a better drug response? Yes, so that's a very important question and it's true that these, many of these candida species, they are normal uh, commensals of our gut or oral uh, microbiome, so they, they live together with, uh, with uh, bacterial communities and it's also very common that uh, candida infections uh, start after treatment with antibiotics, so after disruption of the equilibrium in the bacterial ecosystem and that's maybe when candida can overgrowth and, and cause problems. So there's a, a lot of things we don't understand. Uh, regarding the drug resistance, that's also very important because as it has been seen with, uh, with you know, cancer drugs and other types of drugs, uh, some bacteria can metabolize uh, the drugs and, and we don't know yeah. whether this is happening to, with antifungal drugs. And, and this, these are avenues that we should investigate, but we still know very little. Thanks. Rim? Thank you, Sadri. Okay. Um, hi, uh, Tony. Uh, Rim Kefi is speaking. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, lecture. Um, I have a question. Do you plan, Tony, to have uh, uh, more clinical investigation with uh, other uh, clinical collaborators to understand more the interaction between the uh, candida and uh, the host? Yes, so we, we plan to do this. Uh, on the one hand, we are collecting uh, serial isolates from the same patient uh, taken before and after resistance appeared. Uh, this is quite difficult because uh, yeah, it's, uh, usually isolates are not uh, taken or kept in the hospital. So, but I'm partnering with uh, clinical mycologists to warn them, please keep the strains the isolates during the whole process because I want to compare whether what is happening in the patient is actually reflecting what we see. Regarding the transcriptomics, that's something we are also planning to do, but it's, it's technically very difficult because in any candida infection, uh, the amount of uh, RNA from the fungus is really low. Uh, you, you have an overwhelming uh, majority of RNA from the host and also RNA from, from, from uh, bacteria. So we are working on ways of enriching RNA from the, from the fungus. And we have some, some preliminary results that show that we can actually uh, use you know, RNA capture uh, protocols to capture specifically the RNA from the fungus so we have enough information because otherwise 99% of the reads map to the human genome and very few of them map to the, to the candida genomes and we don't have enough resolution to see what is overexpressed or not. But yes, uh, taking samples directly from the patients, from a blood sample in a systemic infection or from you know, oral or vaginal candidiasis in a superficial infection, we, we want to see actually what is happening there uh, in vivo. 
Thank you, Tony. Uh, last question from, from me is uh, just about the experiment um, dealing with interaction of um, different canida species with uh, vaginal cells. Have you seen instances of uh, transcriptional signatures uh, telling us about how, if uh, in common, you see uh, those signatures dealing with bifilm formation, for instance? Uh, I mean, we do see these pathways uh, mostly in candida albicans, uh, mm -hmm. that they are, you know, uh, overexpressed, but not in the other in the other candidas. Okay. We see very little in common. If we common. see something that is more common, is is pathways related to to iron intake, mm -hmm. and I think uh, they are dealing with um, trying to capture metals yep. from the environment because they need. That's the kind of the only common bottom line we see in all candidates. For the rest, they, they tend to express uh, very different ones. Yeah. This is very different from when you expose them to macrophages in which maybe they are facing, all of them are facing, you know, oxidative stress yeah. and, and, and other types of common stresses. Maybe there you find more common things. But here in, with the epithelial cells, they do totally different things. So mm -hmm. we believe they have totally different ways of interacting with yeah. human epithelia. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. What an exciting talk. And uh, thanks for the audience for interacting with uh, Tony. So uh, now it's time for us to see a bit of our science at Institute Pasteur Tunis and how we interacted in the frame of fine access for reaching excellence, really. So I invite you to uh, stay here and uh, hear our talks from uh, Work Package for Scientists, those that had. Um, support from uh, Work Package 4, and I invite uh, Sundus, uh, to Sundus Hadid to talk to us about uh, the project with acronym EVO Polio, with the title Poliovirus Genome and Cancer Species Evolution in Patients with Primary Immunodeficiencies. Over to Sundus. C'est ça, hein Evo MH, c'est lequel Regardez, regardez. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to present to you our work entitled Poliovirus Genome and Quasi-Species Evolution in Patients with Primary Immunodeficiencies. So, since the introduction of Global Poliovirus Eradication Program in 1988, a huge progress was achieved and currently only two countries still on demand for wild poliovirus type 1. And this was possible since, uh, thanks to the use of oral poliovirus vaccine, which was uh, developed by uh, Albert Sabin. This is an attenuated uh, vaccine, including Sabin 1, Sabin 2, and Sabin 3 strains, which are attenuated uh, poliovirus 1, 2, and 3 strains. And uh, this vaccine is uh, safe and highly immunogenic. Nevertheless, it can, uh, the strains can evolve by accumulation of mutation, especially into the VP1 uh, region, coding for the major antigenic protein. And when this evolution reach one person, the strain is evolved from Sabin-like phenotype to vaccine-derived poliovirus, which increased uh, transmissibility and also virulence uh, uh, potential. The strain is can also present an important number of mixed bases, which uh, is uh, the, the consequence of the intra-host, the, the, the huge intra-host diversity. So there are three types of VDPVs. CVDPVs for circulating strain is among healthy individuals who can cause epidemics. IVDPV for strain is excreted from uh, primary immunodeficient patients. Uh, those strains can be excreted for a long period, up to 10 years. And uh, this patient can uh, constitute a reservoir for potentially neuroviolent uh, strain, who can also infect uh, healthy individuals and cause epidemics and also AVDPV for uh, with, uh, unknown uh, strains with unknown origin. 
So the vaccine-derived polioviruses uh, constitute currently a major concern for the final uh, success of uh, global poliovirus eradication program. For instance, CVDPV were responsible for 44 outbreaks between January 2020 to June 2021. And in our region, the MENA and EMRO region, we are highly concerned by a prolonged IVDPV excretor since our region include the highly number of this type of excretor. The factors contributing to the establishment of uh, prolonged and chronic uh, excretion still unknown. It may be occurrence of specific mutation that help the virus to uh, multiply and uh, uh, establish uh, prolonged excretion and also may be an establishment of particular poliovirus quasi-species that may be difficult to be eliminated by the patient and that can be excreted for a long period. Uh, so in this project, we, uh, we, are, uh, we are interested in both hypothesis, and this was possible in the framework of Find Access program uh, during the training between our lab, which is the WHO Regional Reference Lab for Polyomerates in the EMRO region, and the Laboratory of Virology in Robert Koch Institute in Germany, which is also a WHO Regional Reference Lab for Polyomerates in the European region. I benefited from a stay for one month, and during this stay, it was possible to sequence, uh, sequ uh, sample sequence and sample obtained from IVDPV excretors and uh, to start bioinformatic analysis. And then the bioinformatic will uh, do in, uh, in Tunisia in our lab. So the patients included in our lab, uh, in uh, this study, uh, presented all uh, MHC2 deficiency. There are three patients. The patient one excreted for up to four months VDPV1, and then he succeeded to eliminate the virus. The patient two, uh, she excreted the VDPV3, a highly divergent VDPV3. She was first vaccinated with OPV, and then the excretion was uh, during uh, more than three months, and uh, unfortunately, uh, she died. And also the patient three excreted VDPV3. She presented for the paralysis, and then uh, she excreted the virus during more than nine months. After that, uh, he excreted uh, an enterovirus, another enterovirus, and unfortunately also he died. So uh, first um, we uh, start by sequencing using Illumina technology, and then uh, we used the, the, the pipeline developed first uh, in Germany. We, ab we adapted this pipeline to the bioinformatic environment in Tunisia, and it allows us to obtain consensus sequences and also different variants with respective frequency. And um, we also use the genius uh, program to confirm our result and to obtain such a graphic view. So for patient one, the number of mutations varied from 47 to 62 and are mainly located into the region coding for structural protein. For patient uh, two, we have uh, uh, a strange result, since the number of uh, mutations varied from 187 to 137 with a very high concentration in the, the region coding for a uh, conserved region coded for the polymerase. And for the patient three, the number of mutations varied from 50 to 160, and it was located all along the genome. Uh, uh, so. Uh, Analysis of mutation rate confirmed the, st the strange result obtained for uh, patient two, and that's why I suspected a recombination event. And after analysis of recombination, it was a VDPV strain recombinant with a Sabin-like uh, type one with a brick point uh, at the beginning of uh, the, uh, the P3 region, the region coding for the polymerates. And um, after correction, we obtained the logical uh, result for the rate of mutation and also the amino acid rate. And it's still that the VP1 region, still the highest uh, divergent region in terms of mutation and amino acid changes. After this, we investigate intra-host diversity. So for patient one who uh, succeed to eliminate the virus, uh, there are at least uh, th uh, three different variants in the sample one, and uh, the uh, number of variants are, are, um, uh, are uh, indicated by the rate of mixed bases, 
And into the sample three, the rate of mixed bases, uh, we, we don't have any mixed bases. So uh, in the sample three, we have only one variate. And that's why the patient was able then to eliminate these variates. While for patient two and for patient three, the number of mixed bases were higher. It uh, varied from 30% to 36%, and for the patient three, from 64% to 43%. That was it, wa it was difficult to eliminate the virus. We also investigated neurovirulence reverted mutation. So for patient one, there are a reversion into the VP1 region. And for patient two and three, there are reversion into the five prime UTR region and also in the region coding for the VP3 protein. So in conclusion, the reversion of mutation from Saban to wild phenotype may explain the neurovirulence of excreted strains. And in the other hand, the high intrahost diversity and also maybe the recombination with the Saban-like strain may uh, help multiplication of various and then establishment of continuous or prolonged ex uh, excretion. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, during uh, this work and uh, as a laboratory, la uh, as a virology lab, we was highly uh, implicated in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, pandemic, so it was really difficult to work on other viruses than SARS-CoV-2, and uh, that's why the, the work is still in progress. So we will complete the estimation of evolution rate of VDPV strain, uh, mathematical estimation of quasi-species, and also the structural analysis of modified proteins. Uh, nevertheless, thank, unfortunately, during uh, this pandemic, it was uh, the the, the opportunity to work on SARS-CoV-2 and find access contributed to this work. Uh, we were able uh, to uh, publish one paper entitled In Silico Comparative Study of SARS-CoV-2 Proteins and Antigenic Proteins in BCG, OPV and MMR and other vaccines. And this paper was uh, an enhancer for a second paper, which is uh, a clinical study confirming in silico hypothesis. Also, uh, during my stay in Robert Koch Institute, it was the opportunity to meet uh, German research in Robert Koch Institute and to complete previous uh, uh, started uh, research on hepatitis C. This uh, research uh, was about identification of two novel hepatitis C subtype 2 in Tunisia. And uh, we succeed to publish uh, this work. And also, we were very glad to know in March uh, two uh, 2022 that uh, the, the, the identified uh, genotype was included in the, the list of uh, International Committee for Taxonomy of Viruses. So I would like, at the end, to thank uh, the, uh, the, the, in fact, uh, the research and, and the team uh, from Robert Koch Institute, Sabine and Cindy, Oliver, and also uh, research, uh, Janine and uh, Daniel, who worked on hepatitis C. Our bioinformatics team, who helped a lot, Alia Ben Kahla, Usema, Hussein and Kais, and also my students, my PhD students, who, who worked a lot on the pipeline, and of course our head uh, of laboratory, Professor Henda Triki. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, so questions for Sundas? One or two, maximum. Can I ask one question? Yeah, question. Go ahead. Uh, so, so very interesting. I mean, uh, regarding this reversion of mutations, mm -hmm. uh, we we found this sometimes, um, and uh, it's difficult to distinguish whether it's a reversion of mutation or whether you had the two alleles maybe in the in the population, and then you simply change the frequency of of the alleles. No. Okay, so it was a reversion of mutation implicated in the attenuation of uh, poliovirus. So for if uh, those mutations described was identified as a mutation implicating in the neurovirulence after development of the Sabin strains. And during the multiplication of viruses in immunodeficient patients, they, uh, the virus was able to uh, change from the 
uh, Sabin phenotype and revert to the wild phenotype. So there are mutation implications in neurovirulence. Okay, thank you. Thank you for you. Yes, yeah. Reem, quickly, please, if you have a question. So, first of all, uh, we don't have to vaccinate uh, with uh, attenuated uh, vaccine immunodepressed uh, people. So, uh, in general, they are vaccinated by injected, uh, yeah, in, uh, in, not in inactivated vaccine, okay, not OPV, EPV, first of all. Then, uh, we have to survey uh, immunodeficient person because we still vaccinate with OPV uh, for healthy individual at 60 years and more, okay? So they can be infected through contact, okay? So we have, uh, currently we have a WHO pilot project to, uh, to, uh, for the surveillance of uh, PID to ad identify any excretor. And in the future, uh, we hope that we will be able to treat with antivirals uh, those patients, the excretor for, of poliovirus and also uh, maybe other enteroviruses because enteroviruses 71 or maybe uh, 68 may also cause paralytic cases. Okay, thanks. We should move on. Okay. Thank you very much. Move on with the second talk by Lemia. Gizeni, uh, it's about uh, leishmania, and the title is BMDM's response to leishmania major uh, is driven by MCSF, differentially expressed genes in susceptible and resistant mice. Over to you, Lemia. Uh, Okay, thank you, Sadri. Uh, I'm pleased to be here uh, today, and I will try to share with you what we have done uh, during this project, uh, um, uh, reanalyzing by reanalyzing transcriptomic data that we um, previously generated using monocytes derived from the uh, uh, resistant, uh, resistant and susceptible mice. Uh, this monocyte was and used to differentiate in the presence of MCSF and the obtained macrophages were uh, infected by live and killed inactivated uh, parasites for different time. So uh, the mRNA purified, the purified mRNA were next hybridized uh, used to hybridize Affymetrix array. And in this uh, um, analysis, we first focus on uh, non-infected macrophages and uh, use the data to compare the transcriptomic profile of uh, macrophages derived from bulbous C to that from uh, black 6. And the results revealed here uh, significant differences in the basal background, the basal transcriptomic profile of these two macrophages type, and we identified 200 differentially expressed genes. 25% of these genes belong to uh, immune response in red here in our volcano plot, and half of the remaining genes are connected to gene related to immune system in blue here. And uh, the importance of the immune system in the outcome of the disease and the gene present in each of our list suggests that this differentially expressed gene may have an impact on uh, the uh, macrophage immune response during infection. So we focus on uh, um, um, the genes induced in response to leishmania and uh, we, uh, the pathway enrichment of the differentially expressed genes uh, in uh, mac infected macrophages over all time points show that uh, 
compared to other pathway here, the immune and innate immune response uh, uh, pathway uh, is higher uh, in uh, black six macrophages. This was confirmed by RT-PCR experiment targeting this uh, uh, set of genes uh, in black cyst macrophages. And as you can see here, the infection, uh, the transcription of this Leishmania induced genes is two to six times more important in black six uh, uh, macrophages in, in uh, red here in this figure. Uh, the, uh, it sometimes lasts longer also, and in this susceptible uh, macrophages derived from susceptible mice, this transcription is low uh, even when compared to the one uh, uh, induced by the heat inactivated uh, promastigods, uh, suggesting that uh, uh, Leishmania parasite actively repress uh, some of these uh, genes in uh, uh, macrophages derived from susceptible mice. So what will be the other biological processes induced by Leishmania infection that depend on these uh, differentially expressed genes? And to answer this question, we perform network propagation approach using these differentially expressed genes as seeds and mapped the uh, dynamic response uh, uh, signal to a large protein-protein interaction network uh, uh, integrated from different uh, uh, public resources. And uh, uh, you can see here the result we obtained. We obtained different network module, uh, we, uh, and for each data set we have a large module uh, that contains 76 genes for Belbel C and 95 for Black 6. And uh, these uh, uh, network modules are distinct, uh, which indicate that differences in the basal transcriptomic profile lead to different infection responses. And when we focus on the genes present in all these models, we came with 64 genes unique to bulb C, 63 unique to black 6, and 29 that that shared. So among those, we again identified different uh, uh, genes that belong to immune system. You can see here unique to bulb C, the VGFA, that have been described to be present in the lesion of bulb C, but not in those of black 6. And unique to black 6, you can find IL-8 that attract different kinds of cells, but not macrophages, which must be important in the physiopathology of the disease as the proliferation of uh, the parasite relies on monocyte newly attracted to the site of infection. We also find the migration inhibitory factor that play a key role in innate immunity by activating in, uh, inflammatory cytokine uh, synthesis and NOS2 uh, activation. And STING1 also, STING1 pathway is activated in response to pathogen DNA, but also uh, to host-derived DNA. It induces the recruitment of transcription factor IF3 to stimulate the induction of type 1 interferon. And Leishmania uh, DNA have been shown to activate this pathway leading to the generation of uh, interferon uh, beta. So, uh, in uh, infection, uh, of, uh, Im uh, immune genes is not the only uh, um, biological process that is uh, that depend on these differentially expressed genes, and we find different other genes that are implicated in metabolic pathway, and we identify different genes coding for uh, the uh, uh, glycolytic enzyme. They are transcribed to different level with different kinetics in macrophages derived from either bulb C or black 6 may be due to the differential activation of HIF1 because this uh, uh, transcription factor seem to have different target genes uh, in uh, each of the macrophages type. We identified also for black six different uh, uh, genes uh, coding for a subunit of uh, the, the different uh, um, complexes uh, of the mitochondrial electron uh, chain, and these are implicated in the generation of mitochondrial ROS. 
For uh, now, um, bulbous C, we identify different enzymes, such as the fatty acid enzyme, different other um, uh, bioactive lipid molecule receptor, such as the sphangosine 1-phosphate receptor uh, 2, which is irrepressed in a... Uh, uh, in response to Leishmania infection, which uh, may inhibit the protective role of sphangolipin 1 phosphate that decrease the parasite burden in these macrophages. So clearly, uh, the different uh, biological processes are dependent uh, on these differentially expressed genes, but our uh, uh, approach also highlights differences in the regulation of metabolic pathway. And I will give you here the example of uh, the arginine pathway, which is important in the physiopathology of the disease. As you can see here, NOS2 is uh, shared between the two gen lists, whereas uh, uh, arginosuccinase entitase 1 is unique to BLAC6. And this slide, just to remind you, where uh, arginine succinate, uh, six, arginosuccinase entitase 1 is acting, as you know, macrophage activation stimulates uh, arginine import, and this arginine is metabolized into acetylene that is exported outside the cells. When the uh, extracellular arginine is depleted, this citrulline may be recycled by uh, uh, arginosuccinate synthetase 1 to supply the intracellular arginine. So we uh, checked by RT-PCR uh, the uh, expression of uh, different uh, enzyme implicated in uh, nit nitric oxide, arginine, and uh, citrulline uh, cycles and as you can see here, the uh, expression in uh, black seas is higher starting six hours uh, post-infection. So why these differences in enzyme transcription? This may be due to reduced expression of the arginine transporter in black seas macrophages that we observe in our data, which will decrease the uptake of extracellular arginine, inducing the recycling of citrulline, which is the preferred substrate for uh, nitric oxide production. Recycling of arginine and the enhanced nitric oxide production have been reported uh, as important in host defense against uh, mycobacteria, both in vitro and in vivo. So uh, uh, I just uh, just last slide, please. Just we're slide, out yeah, of time. This slide and this enhanced production, together with uh, the accumulation of uh, glutathione that we already have uh, reported, could result in the formation of dinitrosyl iron complexes, which will trap will trap the uh, nitric oxide, uh, uh, preventing its cytotoxic effect. Uh, uh, cytotoxic effect. It may be also deliver outside the cell through this multidrug resistant protein 1 that is expressed in the uh, uh, genes unique to BLAC6, which will uh, restrict the local enrollment of inflammatory cell, limiting the multiplication of the parasite. So in conclusion, we have highlighted here differences in gene expression profile induced in response to MCSF between BMDM derived from uh, resistant or susceptible mice. Our analysis show that different biological uh, um, uh, systems are dependent on this different, uh, differentially expressed gene that thus could be crucial for the functional phenotype that macrophages uh, can adopt or recruit in response to Leishmania infection. So this work has been uh, realized uh, with the, uh, the uh, collaboration of uh, the, um, Dr. Ralph Erving from the Max Planck Institute to Dr. Alia Ben Kahla and different members of my groups, Dr. Iman and Sameh Rebhi and Sirin Bouabi. Thank you. So I invite you to ask questions later on during the lunch to Lamia because we're running out of time. Uh, thanks, Lamia. Uh, Fatma. Next speaker, Fatma Girfeli. Um, who will be talking to us about translation project dealing with uh, a nice question here is virulence in the sequence about it's about genomic and transcriptomic insights uh, from Leishmania field isolates over to you Fatma 
Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot, Sadri, for the, introducing the title so that I don't have to repeat it. So my name is Fatma Girfeli. I'm presenting this work on behalf of the group, uh, all our group that has been uh, doing this uh, great job, I think, um, and with our collaborators at IP Pasteur, which are the biomics platform. So what is this talk about? Well, again, Leishmania, so I'm super happy uh, that uh, uh, we had Lamia before, so that she introduced you a bit with the pathway, to the pathways, so I don't have to repeat that again, but it's all about, for us, about working with humans, working with cutaneous leishmaniasis that is endemic in the country, and working with the clinical severity profiles that we do observe. And our main question here was, sorry, thanks. The main question that we had is how can we relate the virulence that we are observing in this clinically um, um, selected uh, isolates to the virulence profiles of these isolates. So cutaneous leishmaniasis is again endemic in Tunisia and we have been in close contact thanks to an epidemiology team that was, is working on the field to collect this data set. Uh, and these samples, and we have been in close contact with different severity profiles that we were observing in patients. And you have here some kind of these snapshots on the different severity profiles that were observed. And we knew, of course, that these different severity profiles are classically observed in patients and can be due to different immunological background. That's obvious. But what isn't clear was the contribution of parasite biomarkers of virulence to the disease severity that was observed in patients. So to tackle this disease, a lot of different people are working th worldwide, uh, either working on the vector part to explain these different severity profiles, working on, with the host itself, or working with the parasite. We do also work with the three, these three different aspects, but I'm going to highlight today what we are dealing with here, which is high throughput omics approaches to understanding and to identifying parasite virulence markers. So, first of all, we started asking ourselves, can really, can, sorry, are you uh, hearing an echo, or is it just me? Yeah, maybe. If I can find this. No, it's unmuted. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so first, we, we started asking ourselves, can, can, can we find something related to virulence in the sequence itself? Well, we lack actually the full understanding of the genomic and transcriptomics and post-transcriptomics regulation that do exist in this parasite. It's a very interesting parasite in the sense that we do not have these classical signals, but we know that something is going on in terms of genomic regulation, in terms of anoploidy mechanisms, in terms of gene dosage mechanism, copy number variations in there, and also mutations that do lead to something that is impeding somehow the expression of genes. But not only that, because in these parasites, there is a lot to do with post-transcriptional reg regulation as well. So we wanted to tackle these from high throughput uh, omics approaches by using genomic approaches and transcriptomics approaches. Uh, so this started actually many, many years ago when we started collecting these samples, thanks again to the epidemiology team from Asitu Pasteur in Tunis who worked a lot uh, with patients directly in contact with them. Uh, they have been enrolling more than 8,000, 18, sorry, 1,000, uh, sorry, 1,800 patients. So what they did is to take these patients and follow them up until, so from the onset of the disease till the cure. So we have a follow-up and a lot of samples that were collected, a lot of isolates. So what we did with these isolates? So first is to double check the severity score that we observed in these patients. What was the the induration and ulceration areas, and this has been uh, calculate, has helped us calculate this, what we call a severity score, thanks to mathematical uh, formula that has been developed from the epidemiology team. And then what we did is to take these samples out from the patients, put them into culture, double check what is happening in terms of pathogenicity, and double check what is happening in terms of their in vitro growth. The idea behind that was to make sure that we were not dealing with parasites that are not, you know, um, 
uh, explain uh, that the difference into the severity profiles that is not explained only by parasite markers. So we wanted to get rid of any possible severity profile that we could um, correlate only to the host background. So if these isolates were into the same background, which is the mice the, here, if they are reproducing exactly the same severity profiles that we are observing in patients, then that was bingo for us, because this means that these parasites are having something intrinsic that could explain these severity profiles. So these kind of different scores and many others helped us classify our parasites, and we detected ones that, are, that we call hypervirulent and ones that we, did, we call hypovirulent. So remember the color code, because I will be using this for the rest of the um, talk. First question before going further into the high throughput omics, because these cost a lot in terms of time and money. So we wanted to make sure that we were observing something different in between these different parasites. So we just basically put them into THP1 cells in culture and double check if they were giving us different also infectivity profiles. And this indeed was the case. And that's the work from Ali Ben Shir from our group. And then um, from also other omics study that we did, we started thinking about, can we really identify biomarkers from all these high throughput omics studies that would be having a clear effect then, a functional validation? Well, the answer is yes, because we previously also had a gene that we have been working on, that we have been isolating thanks to different omics uh, projects. And what we did is to take one specific gene. So we had a bunch of differentially expressed genes, as Lamia was explaining. And then we did different and several cutoffs. We double check what were the different um, pathways that were involved in there. And we specifically targeted one that is involved, a particular gene that is involved in post-transcriptional pathways. And this gene was highly, uh, thank you so much, whatever you did for that echo, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so that particular gene was highly expressed in the less virulent parasites. So what we did is basically take this gene, produce transgenic parasites, overexpress them into the highly virulent one, and we wanted to double check if with this higher expression we were having again a loss of the virulence. Okay, so I'm just saying that as if I was kidding, like if it would have been something very easy, but that's the work that has been mainly done by Eamon uh, from our group, and that was kind of a cumbersome task. But finally, we made it, and we proved with this analysis that indeed, when this gene is highly expressed, then we lose the virulence. And this is what, what we observed into patients, uh, into, sorry, into mice. So this brought us to further expand our analysis. And thanks to the two different projects that we conducted within the frame of the find access uh, projects, we conducted a comparative genomics of much more than only these two species that I was telling you about, and even more in terms of transcriptomics. So I won't be detailing all what, we've, what we did, but basically we did a de novo DNA sequencing using long read sequencing for the genomics, and we did comparative genomics, and for the transcriptomics, we had parasites that we put under certain selective pressures, different ones, different conditions, and we are comparing them now. So that's, this talk is kind of a spoiler to what would be you know, coming into our next publication that we hope to submit by the end of the year, but I don't have all the analysis done yet, so sorry for that. So first project was to do the de novo sequencing, we had uh, 16 isolates, we passed them on to PacBio. Uh, they come from three different Lesmania species, different isolates, in order to be able to see here with the different uh, hypervirulence profiles or hypervirulent profiles. Sorry, here, um, some of them are not appearing, but you have the idea. So uh, in, we did that in two benches of sequencing, because and this explains a bit the delay that we had in terms of analyzing these, because we did that in two different runs, and uh, the biomics uh, collaborators were kind enough to, to help them to help us do that uh, quite quickly. So uh, compared, uh, so if we compare the first run to the second run, the improvements are huge. We made it to uh, lower down the number of contigs 
and we had largest contigs with uh, the second study, which is allowing us now to confidently go through the comparative genomics, and we double check then we had enough coverage depth and enough, uh, a huge total length, I would say, from these um, uh, contigs so that we can go further with the analysis. And this is what we did. So actually, this is just one of the possible snapshots of the different things that we have been comparing. You have here basically the different uh, isolates that we have been seeing. And this is the reference genome, and this is the reference annotation at the very bottom. And you can see th here that already, this is just one example of what we are observing in field isolates that is totally different from the reference genome. And guess what? Here, there are a lot of genes that are related to virulence profiles. For the, for the others, okay. So these are for the, uh, correlate, these are amastins. They are correlated to virulence. And they have been, the only thing is that they appear a lot in the different parts of the genome, but clearly there is something related to gene dosage. I'm not showing all the results, but believe me, this is something that is very important for us. Um, and we also did that with the previous analysis and we'll be doing, recomputing that with these new species. We have been uh, double checking the SNPs profiles into the hyper virulent profiles and the hypo virulent profiles. And we are um, here um, highlighting those that do have a high impact. So a mutation with a high impact means that it is impeding the gene to be properly expressed. And here is the possible correlation between the mutations that we observed and the transcriptomics changes that we are uh, um, identifying. Same thing here for the other strain, and we are particularly focusing on the SNPs with, uh, that, that do have a very low impact. I'm not showing also the different aneuploidy profiles, but Leishmania species, they are so good at doing that. They have different ploidy profiles in between the different chromosomes in each isolate. And with, for each isolate, if you put it in culture, in between the different passages, you would be having different aneuploidy profiles. And this can also be related to virulence. Uh, in terms of copy number variation, we didn't observe much of this, but we still need to double check with the other uh, isolates. So what we did is to correlate all these, like SNPs, indels, and copy number variations, and we come up with a list of genes that do have a particular interest. Uh, again, uh, some of these are related to hypothetical proteins, some of these are, as Lamia was saying, related to fatty acid metabolisms, but we are still studying these, because you, as you can imagine it, I mean, this has um, a lot of functional studies to be dealt with after all. Now for the transcriptomics, we had a lot more isolates um, and coming from two species, and <clears throat> we did our comparative analysis, it is still ongoing, but we double checked that we had replicates that were behaving the same way, and we are able to separate the, 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 the expression profiles um, in between the different groups of isolates. So there is clearly something going on here in terms of differential expression. And we have enough reads and enough sequencing to be able to interpret our results. Uh, we also did a lot of vol volcano plots in order to be able to compare the differentially regulated genes. And this process is still undergoing because we are comparing them in a, into a pairwise comparison before doing that uh, on, the ban on, on, the, on the 20 uh, samples that we have. All these analyses have been done thanks to the Sequena uh, pipeline that has been uh, developed by our colleagues at IP uh, Pasteur. And this has been done uh, previously to show how we can compare two samples in a pairwise co correlation and how we can identify the genes that are differentially regulatedly expressed. And we did, in fact, found that. Um, so just to finish with the final thing that we are aiming to, and we did that already for the two species that are showing the, the, the most div divergent profiles, the, the, the red ones and the green ones, if you remember, and we indeed found some specific chromosomes where we can uh, find the close correlation between the genes that are expressed and their level of expression and specific genes encoding for genes that are related to virulence profiles. And for some of these uh, chromosomes, we even identified 
um, regions that are totally absent from our field isolates, showing that there is clearly something that is missing when the parasite adapted to that geographical region that is Tunisia, that is different from the reference uh, genome. And this is why we were thinking about having a reference genome and hence the de novo sequencing, uh, so having a reference genome for our uh, local um, isolates. So with this, that was, I hope, a spoiler for our upcoming uh, publications on the field. Our collaboration is still ongoing with all these uh, nice people that we have been uh, collaborating with. So I would like to thank the biomics team. I'm, I'm keeping here Pasteur Institute, pa Paris, and CRG because uh, there, are, there have been a lot of discussions pending with them and collaborations ongoing for this project. But the main major part of it has been done uh, with uh, biomics. So I do thank Marc Monod and Imen Najjar for taking over and accepting this uh, project. And also, so that is the DNA seq project, that is the transcriptomics project. And I do thank the people that were there for sample preparation. Of course, the epidemiology team uh, who isolated the samples at the very beginning, but all our team, Ayman Shiraz and Ali, for doing the samples preparation. The library prep has been done by Elodie Turc for transcriptomics and by Laurence, that is here today uh, with us for this project. And also, I would like to thank Thomas Cochler for the um, uh, uh, dry uh, part for the de novo uh, DNA seq and the tripod for the transcriptomics with Etienne Cornobis. So thanks a lot, and thanks to Find Access for giving us the money. Beautiful tree, uh, colorful. So I'm going to give one uh, opportunity for those that are online to ask one question, please. And then you can interact with Fatma later on, because we're, if there is a uh, question from our guests online. Uh, Quickly, no, Hisham. Okay, maybe a question from the audience. So quickly. Okay, um, Fatma, what are the determinants of this unemployment? Do you th uh, are you, are there uh, a mating occurring between so exchange of information between uh, leishmania? Well, actually, one of the one of the regions that uh, we're having we, we have collected results from is the mixed genome side. Yeah. Uh, a mixed focus. So we do believe that there is something going on there in the, the patients. Uh, none that we have a proof of uh, yet for the parasite that we have been sequencing, but it doesn't mean that it's not occurring, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's a eukaryotic organism. And, and in Canada, Albicans, for instance, some instances of, an, of aneuploidy occur. But we've never seen meiosis in Canada, Albicans. So we think it's a way for heterogeneity and uh, stuff like that. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, we move on with the next speaker. Um, uh, sorry, we, we have one sorry. question. Sorry. Sorry. sorry okay. So do you see correlation between SNPs in the genes or promoters and the respective expression level? Yes, definitely. So these are the uh, effects. So we have been classifying the SNPs in terms of the possible effects that they could have in gene expression. So uh, we had uh, some that, are, that do have a very low impact to some that do have a modifier impact, a moderate impact, or to a high impact. And those that we are focusing on are those that do have a high impact, and high impact means a lot of different things among which we could find gaining a stop, for example, or, or you know, withdrawing a start. Uh, and, and it could be many things, but definitely it impedes the protein to be normal. So yes, thanks. I'll be happy to take your question during any of the breaks. Uh, quickly, quickly, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Fatma, for the presentation. My question is about: uh, uh, Do you check for for the confection of the? Uh, excuse me. Can you just a little louder? Sorry, I'm not do you, hearing. Do you, do you check for the confection? Of the, of uh, the patient of, or the or the vector or the host with other pathogen in addition to the virus, the, instead to, to explain maybe the various is related to the, uh, the to the competition with other pathogens. So concerning the co-infections, we had that um, since the very beginning. Since we take the samples out from the field, we double check using uh, specific you know PCR that we are dealing with this species, this species, or this species. So that's done since the very beginning. So we could classify them into different you know um, groups. 
But then uh, we also double check for, um, there are a lot of studies that have been uh, correlating the presence of a certain virus into these uh, leishmania and that have been correlated to virulence and we did these experiments uh, actually with specific specific primers we did that <laughs> many years ago but we didn't find unfortunately many uh, you know any evidence of that and we have been discussing that also with collaborators from switzerland and and we were about to sending them the the, the samples but it never happened for you know constraints money constraints but we didn't find any here okay thank you so much thank you guys uh, next speaker is um, Emna Hriga. Uh, she will be talking about sequencing and characterization of the kinetoplast genome of Leishmania parasite. Go ahead, Emna. Merci, Sadri. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today and present our work uh, entitled Sequencing and Characterization of the Kinetoplast Genome of Leishmania Parasite. Our project is called LeshKDNA. Um, well, the kinetoplast DNA is uh, what represents in a eukaryotic organism the mitochondria. Leishmania parasites, like uh, all other kinetoplasts, they present one unique mitochondrion that contains the kinetoplast, which is composed of a network, a complex network uh, of uh, circular molecules that can be divided into two types. So we have the mixed circles, which are the biggest one. They have a length of 20 to 23 kb, and mini circles uh, that are uh, of a length of uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, pair of bases. So maxi circles and mini circles have a specific topology. The first ones can exist in 20 to 50 copies, and present a conserved, mainly a conserved part that would contain genes coding for ribosomal RNAs, uh, proteins of the respiratory chain, and other some guided uh, RNAs. The divergent region is a non-coding region that is uh, relatively small, and, that uh, and the maxi circles uh, can be more or less subject to uh, gene editing through guided RNA located on the mini circles. The mini circles, which are the smallest molecules, also present a conserved region that includes three uh, conserved sequence blocks, C CSB1, CSB2, and CSB3, that, uh, that present the, uh, the fingerprint of these molecules. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, divergent region, which is quite big, is rich in AT and includes the transcription units of guided RNA, and there is uh, not much known about that region in terms of conservation between species and within the kinetoplastidae uh, themselves. So many circles also have uh, the an organization within classes. So these are molecules that can be classified according to the type of guided RNA that they contain. And a class can contain one minicircle to more than 100 minicircles. So up to now, there are some works that have been published to establish and elucidate what is the kinetoplast, what is the, the kinetoplast genome of the kinetoplastidae in general. For Leishmaniasis, there were in 2015 a publication about two strains of Leishmania tarantuli, which is a non-pathogenic uh, uh, species of Leishmania parasites. So Simpson and all demonstrated that there were different uh, sizes of classes, a number of classes of mini circles between the different strains of the same species. And this was confirmed by other uh, works. So uh, the thing with Simpson, they, they used the PAC biolong grid sequencing, which was not the case for the other uh, works from Camacho 2019 and Busotti 2020. So the, late, the latest just used the unmapped trees from uh, Illumina projects on a different species of Leishmania. And they tried to, uh, to assemble and, uh, maxi circles and mini circles from these different species. So the findings have corroborated the fact that we can have different numbers of classes and the classes may vary in a size in terms of number of mini circles and within one class. They validated their uh, interests as markers, as they can uh, be used for phy phylogenetic studies and species identification. And in Bosotti 2020, the authors uh, 
suggested an association between resistance to treatment and a specific pattern within uh, mini circles classes. So the hypothesis of, the, of our work is that the kinetoplast DNA is an important source and resource to identify novel biomarkers, either for diagnosis or for the identification of novel uh, drug targets against Eschmaniasis. And our objective is to use long read sequencing technologies to elucidate this uh, kinetoplast genome, assemble and annotate it, and generate new knowledge about it towards novel biomarkers identification. So we will first start by sample preparation uh, through parasite cult uh, culture of two strains of Leishmania amphantum. We have processed uh, uh, our uh, samples in order to purify the mitochondria. This step is very important in order to eliminate uh, uh, at a maximum level uh, any contamination by the nuclear genome. Then we did the DNA extraction and um, prior to send our samples to genomic score facility in the University of Leuven in uh, Belgium. Uh, this was uh, done uh, thanks to uh, the fund of the EG Genomics from H2020 grant that we obtained in order to have our samples uh, sequenced using the PacBio single molecule real-time sequencing technique at the genomics core. So raw data was uh, sent to us back and the bioinformatics anal an analysis uh, is undergoing uh, with, in collaboration with NCG Pasteur uh, partners from the BioHub, uh, thanks to uh, the uh, funding of Find Access. So, um, for the sample preparation, uh, as I said, we have used two samples from Elan Phantom Laboratory strains. They cause two different clinical manifestations of Leishmania. LV15 is causing visceral leishmanizers and REP14 is causing cutaneous leishmanizers. We were able to obtain a sufficient quantity and a good quality of uh, the DNA prior to be sent for uh, the sequencing. And for LV15, we were able to obtain up to 11 micrograms for uh, our sample. So we have been, uh, the sequencing was done with PacBio SMRT uh, SQL1 technique. And I'll be presenting the results for LV15 uh, strains. So since we had sufficient uh, DNA quantity, we were able to sequence, uh, to, uh, to do double runs of sequencing for this uh, particular sample. The first sample was uh, quite overloaded and the second has uh, much better results. So for the first sample, we had less sequence number, but with the highest, uh, 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 the a highest, uh, bigger length of the, the reads that we obtained. For the second one, we have a bigger number of uh, sequences up to, if you can say, no. So we had more than uh, six millions. Uh, can you show the mouse? No, it's, so not, it's not working. It doesn't work? Uh, real mouse. Real mouse. <laughs> yeah. You told me. <laughs> So uh, we had up to more than 6 million sequence for sample 2 with a median length of uh, 2 uh, KB. So we continued uh, the analysis with post samples in order to be able that we are really covering all the uh, data correctly. So our first strategy was to uh, subtract all reads that would map on the nuclear uh, genome prior to assemble de novo our uh, uh, kDNA uh, genome then for annotation and quantification. We used the Minimap2 uh, tool and we were able more or less to map all the contigs on the nuclear uh, genome which was problematic. So this is why we used the second strategy where we first assembled our genomes using FLY which is a de novo assemble for single molecule sequencer reads. And then we checked uh, the completedness and uh, non redundancy of and the redundancy of the processed uh, genomes using Bosco. So for both samples, we were able to obtain uh, 85 and 152 uh, contigs that were assembled 
correctly assembled. And then we did the subtraction of the nuclear reeds out of them. So we were left with 47 and 108 for both samples, as you can see here. And these uh, contigs were then, uh, will be then processed for uh, further analysis. So the work is ongoing. This is where we have gone uh, up to now. I would like to uh, emphasize on the fact that dealing with long, uh, uh, long read sequencing is uh, a quite complex task, and I'm happy that uh, we, we were able to have collaborators to help us with us. So in order to conclude, I would like to emphasize the fact that also this is the first work, uh, to our knowledge, that have sequenced the uh, Lashmania and Phantom Kinetoplast DNA using long read uh, techniques, except for Simpson, who were focused on non-pathogenic uh, species, which is not the case for our uh, samples, of course. So for now, we have performed the uh, assembly, de novo, the de novo assembly of uh, this genome. Hopefully we will be able to check and validate the structure of that genome and maybe submit it to be a reference genome if everything is going well with both samples. We have now in hand uh, different contigs up to 180 from one samples to be uh, submitted to circularity check as these molecules are supposed to be circular in, uh, within the uh, parasite. We will be completing the annotation of maxi circles and classification of mini circles to understand how, for our strains, things are going with the mini circle classes. And to conclude this work, we, we hopefully will be able to have novel biomarkers for diagnosis or for treatments to be provided to the scientific committee. And I would like to uh, thank all my collaborators and colleagues from my lab, my, uh, my head of uh, um, laboratory, Dr. Ikram Gizeni, uh, Usem Aswiyai for uh, technical assistance with uh, the data and analysis handling, Imen Mkede, Imen Basumi, Yusuf Zina Abdelkin Arafah, will have for the uh, sample preparation, and our collaborators from the genomics school at the University of Leuven for the sequencing uh, work, and from Institut Pasteur, namely uh, Rachel Legendre, Claudia Chica, and Natalia for their assistance and the final access team. Thank you for your attention. What a challenging project really so the merit goes to you because i think it's there's some quite a lot of challenges to uh, do all of these sequencing so you have questions from the audience and preferentially from online attendees if there are questions online okay yes so uh, thank you emna for this uh, presentation that was nice work my question is about the, the choice of the, of, the, of the sequencing, the technology that you, that you select. It was a pack view. Why you don't use uh, uh, nanopower technology? Because in our institute, you know, actually, we have two sequencers. Well, this work has uh, begun a little bit uh, earlier than uh, when we had the nanopore. And uh, I'm not sure if the length of the reads would be the same between both techniques. The idea is really to be able at um, a maximum uh, way to uh, cut each maxi circle or mini circle once and have the whole molecule sequenced as one read. So the idea is really not to not to map any small reads on any reference genome and be able to identify big parts of the, that genome as it is with the highest quality. And PacBio appeared as uh, the, the most, it is definitely most compli more complicated and more expensive, but it is uh, more uh, adapted to the objective that we had. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Fatma, yes, quickly, yeah. please. Yeah. So um, just to, to quickly add on that, um, uh, Wasfi, this, the, 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 the major difference is also, if I may add to what Emna just said, is the fact that we, with PacBio, we can have what we call hi-fi reads, and this is exactly what we did as well. So these are high-fidelity reads that are produced in a certain way so that you can produce kind of a consensus sequence. It's a higher fidelity, as the name is saying, and here, 
she's trying to have kind of a reference genome, which is a bit different from what we can do with nanopore. Just to mention to the audience. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Fatma. Okay, we move on with the next speaker and last one for this morning session. Uh, there is a question from uh, Oliver on the chat, uh, Sadri. There's a question online? Yeah. Um, Oliver from RKI saying, do you see correlation between SMP? No, no, this has been, uh, has been uh, the question for like two talks yeah, I'm sorry. earlier. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, it's sorry. been already okay. raised. Okay, that's yeah, fine. Thank you. Do we have a question or not? Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Emna. Um, next speaker is Qais Dira, who's going to be talking about another parasite, uh, Tillery and Oleta, and uh, about genomic investigation of the resistance of uh, that parasite to bupiravacone and the molecular interaction of the drug with cytochrome B. Go ahead, Qais. Thanks, uh, Sadri. So, hi, everyone. Uh, so, through this presentation, I will uh, give you an overview about our project, named uh, HIT Teleria. And HIT Teleria stands for Genomic Investigation of the Resistance of uh, Teleria Annulata to Buparvacone and the Molecular Interaction of the Drug with uh, Cytochrome B. So uh, I will start by an overview, and as you may know, so teleriosis is a disease caused by a species, uh, species which, which is a blood-borne blood, blood -borne, uh, parasite uh, named uh, teleria, and uh, which is transmitted uh, by a tick as a vector. And uh, among the most uh, important uh, species that cause clinical diseases in cattle are uh, teleria annulata, which is the agent of tropical teleriosis, which is widespread in uh, North Africa, including our country, but also in uh, other regions. So for these diseases, chemotherapeutic agents such as buparvacone are available to treat teleria annulata, uh, but also teleria parva uh, infections. And the previous uh, studies have uh, showed that buparvacone acts on the cytochrome, uh, cytochrome B, so the, 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 of the parasite, and uh, bind to the cyto cytochrome B. So while uh, treatment uh, exists, uh, so these agents do not completely eradicate uh, teleria infection, and some uh, teleria annulata strains have acquired resistance um, uh, through time against uh, this uh, treatment through the accumulation of mutation, uh, especially in cytochrome B. Okay. So uh, the, here um, there is a need to design a new drug and uh, find other therapeutic alternative that can uh, mimic the effect of uh, buparvacone and can be active again against uh, resistant uh, teleria. And this is our uh, ultimate goal. So the, the ultimate goal of this project is to design a new molecule that can mimic the effect of buparvacone and be active against resistant uh, teleria annulata parasites. So for this project, uh, how uh, we proceeded in order to achieve uh, our goal? So uh, we started by uh, extracting 30 blood samples from Tunisian uh, bovine. And uh, for uh, these uh, 30 blood samples, we have 20 samples containing uh, resistant uh, teleria annulata uh, parasite to buparvacone, and 10 samples uh, containing sensitive uh, one. Uh, and uh, from, from these samples, DNA has been extracted and sequencing at Biomix, so our partner in Institut Pasteur uh, Paris, at very low uh, cost uh, within uh, the frame of Find Access uh, project, using an Illumina platform with one uh, 100x uh, coverage and with a paired end li library and read length of uh, 150 uh, base pair. So, uh, when we received the, uh, the, um, the, the sequencing uh, data, so we have generated uh, a bioinformatic pipeline and collaboration with our partner from uh, CRG, uh, starting from uh, raw data analysis, quality, quality control, and uh, trimming. Uh, then we used uh, Kraken 2 to identify the different species, species that exist within uh, the samples and uh, we performed a decontamination uh, process so the f uh, with uh, performing double mapping the first one was against the the host uh, the host species which is uh, bostorus and we kept here the unmapped reads 
And for the NMAP release, we perform another uh, mapping against Telluria annulata, and here we kept only the mapped uh, reads, and we performed genome assembly, and uh, so we evaluated the different uh, uh, assemblies, either for uh, sensitive strains and uh, resistant strains to, to be barbacons. So we also, uh, so the, the, the we, we, uh, we performed variant calling between uh, the, the resistant strains uh, against uh, the, the sensitive strains as a reference to identify the different variations that can uh, re be related to the resistance to, uh, to Buparbacon. And uh, so this is for the genomic uh, part, and in parallel, we have performed a pipeline for uh, structural bioinformatics uh, pipeline. And here uh, we have modeled uh, the cytochrome uh, B uh, 3D structure and also the, the, the 3D structure of the buparbacon. And we have performed a molecular docking between both uh, interaction. We have identified the binding sites involved in this kind of interaction and uh, so uh, variation identified here will be mapped uh, within the complex to uh, understand the effect of uh, the variation of, uh, on the binding of uh, the, C the, the buparbacon to cytochrome B. And uh, this will help us to, to understand uh, why uh, Buparvacon is not able to uh, to to be active against uh, against cytochrome B, and uh, will allow us to design a new molecule. So, as uh, main results, I will start by the genomic uh, part. So, here in yellow, we have some statistics regarding uh, the, the the genomic uh, investigation before uh, decontamination and after decontamination. And as you can see here, so uh, here uh, an example of genome assembly, and here you can see the size uh, obtained before decontamination and after decontamination. And uh, I should notice here that the Telaria annulata genome size is estimated to be around eight to 10 megabytes. So here uh, we have um, 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 a size that is more than uh, expected. So we have uh, clearly uh, contamination by other, other species. And uh, as you can see here, so uh, after decontamination, we have uh, something that is equal to what we uh, expected. And currently we are re uh, uh, refining our uh, pipeline in order to capture only uh, reads that are specific to Telluria annulata. So for the structural bioinformatic part, so uh, we, we retrieved the chemical uh, structure of the buparvacon from the PubChem uh, database and uh, using PyMol we were able to model the 2D and the 3D structure of the buparvacon. And uh, using uh, homology modeling, uh, we also uh, be able to, uh, to, to identify the 3D structure of the para, uh, uh, cytochrome B of uh, the, the, the parada, uh, pa parasite, sorry, and uh, which contains L, uh, eight uh, elises. And uh, using this uh, structure, we have identified uh, the binding sites uh, that are involved in the, the, the interaction with, uh, between uh, the ligand, piparvacon, and the receptor, uh, cytochrome B. So we have identified two sites, as you can see uh, here. And uh, here we put uh, the, in, um, in blue color, you have the amino acids that are very important in, the, uh, in, the, in, in this interaction. And for the second side, uh, we have the same thing. And in, uh, yeah, uh, in red color, you have uh, the hypothetical hotspot that would, uh, would uh, be important in, the, in this kind of inter interaction. We also performed the, the molecular docking between uh, buparvacon and cytochrome B. And as you can see, so here is uh, the buparvacon. Here is the structure of uh, cytochrome B. And here we have our uh, two sites. 
and we have uh, showed that uh, these uh, two sites allowed, uh, allowed the, the, the interaction of uh, the ligand with our receptor with high affinity and also we have identified the amino acids that, uh, that are involved in this, uh, this kind of interaction and this is very important because uh, after, uh, after that we can, we can uh, if, if you have one mutation uh, here or one variation in one of these amino acid, we can uh, we can uh, easily understand why the uh, the biparvacone is not uh, is not able active uh, is not uh, active uh, on uh, on uh, cytochrome B. So this uh, has been performed using Autodoc Vina tool. And uh, currently, so uh, it's an ongoing work, so we are working on identifying mutations in resistant uh, strains compared to sensitive ones through variant calling analysis. And once this mutation or variation will be identified, these latter will be mapped uh, in um, resistant strains on the predicted 3D complex interaction of the cytochrome B with buparvacone. Uh, this will allow us to understand uh, this kind of uh, interaction and to design a novel molecule that mimic the effect of uh, buparvacone uh, that will be later on uh, testing, uh, tested in silico uh, for the molecular interaction between the two, uh, the two molecules. So this is an, on an ongoing uh, work. So uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, our uh, Ministry of uh, Research and Higher Education uh, that funded the project under, uh, in the frame of the um, program uh, d'encouragement des jeunes chercheurs. Uh, and the, these funds have been used to, uh, to perform the sequencing with our uh, partner from uh, Biomix and namely uh, I would like to thank Iman Najjar and uh, Mark Mounou, our uh, partner from uh, Biomix and uh, this was uh, done with a very, uh, very low cost. And uh, also, uh, I would like to thank our colleague from uh, CRG who worked uh, with us in collaboration uh, in, on this uh, project, and namely Damiana Kastelic, uh, Julia Pamarenko, um, uh, uh, Paolo Di Tomazzo, and uh, Tony, Tony Hermoso. Uh, <laughs> I, I forget uh, some names. And uh, I would like to, to thank my collaborators here in the Institute Pasteur of Tunis, Dr. Melik Sheosh and also Dr. Moaz Mahadbi, my PhD student uh, Selim Kamoun and uh, Shayma Hakimi for uh, the genomic uh, part. And also my uh, master's student Iman Mizewi for the structural bioinformatics part that have been uh, co-supervised uh, by my colleague uh, Usama Khamesi. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. So, uh, question or two? Uh, from the audience, maybe, or online, still. Guys, in the beginning, how did you select your resistant strain of DNA? Uh, yeah. Uh, this question uh, could be answered by my colleague here, uh, Melik Sheosh, because uh, Melik and uh, Moaz have performed uh, the experiment part of uh, this uh, project. So ha they have selected the resistant one, they have selected the sensitive one, and uh, yeah. So I don't know Melik is here or not yet, Melik? So the question was how the uh, strains were selected, uh, the resistant and susceptible. So uh, thank you, guys. Uh, so basically, the the uh, the, the resistant and the the naive one was selected on field. So we did the uh, on field uh, study and see uh, after treatment uh, of the uh, the cows with uh, with the bupropion, and uh, and we selected after this uh, this uh, this test. So we found some of them were. Uh, resistant to the treatment and the other world where the the uh, the, uh, the drugs works works well so so that's why that's how we uh, we selected the uh, the different uh, sample so this this work came after like three or four different uh, we we tested on field then we uh, we sequenced only the the cytochrome b gene and we find some some uh, some snips and some mutation uh, specific for for the uh, for the uh, resistant ones, and then we move on to the to the whole genome sequencing and the uh, 
and look for the, uh, the new drugs for, for, for this kind of disease. Okay, thank you all. So Thanks, this man. morning, so any question? Well, second, second one, maybe. Um, okay. No. Okay, thank you all. So you've seen this morning's session was about parasites and viruses. The afternoon session is about mycoplasma, TB, candida, and the microbiota in health and disease. Thank you so much, and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>